I was listening while Chad was sharing and you were laughing hysterically. You're amening, so engaged. None of that's gonna happen, all right? <laughs> this is, the, this is the, the antithesis of that uh, experience. You know, when I became a follower of Christ uh, around the age of 20, I, I had no background in Christianity at all. I'd never been, I didn't even know churches existed. I'd never seen a Bible in my life. And, and so, so many of the things that, that I learned as I stepped into faith actually didn't make any sense to me, but I just accepted them because I wanted to be accepted. And since everyone leaned in, I, I leaned in too. And since everyone said amen, I said amen too. But there was always this part of my brain that thought to myself, that doesn't really make any sense, but I'm gonna go ahead and believe that anyway. And, and then eventually, as I started growing and diving into the scriptures and trying to unwrap what Jesus actually is teaching us, there's so many things I, I, I just began to feel pressed against. Hey guys, are you gonna keep playing? And uh, it's, it's cool, and just, I, I'm just not going to be that emotional or that inspiring, okay? I, I'm feeling huge, huge pressure, okay? And, and uh, thank you, all right, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Thank you guys, I love you, I love you. Give him a hand. And, uh, <laughs> I wasn't sure if they're waiting for a signal, you know, or, but I mean, I could vamp. I could just completely change my talk and just kind of like go off and then you guys could have fun. But, uh, and I think sometimes what happens is that we, we read the scriptures and we actually think we're listening to what it says, but we're listening to what Christianity has said about those verses for 2,000 years. Like there's one particular verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16, where the, the last section says, but you have the mind of Christ. And, and that's a pretty significant statement. I, I'm not even gonna pretend I fully understand what that means. But I, I do know that there are different kinds of minds and what's connected to a mind is a brain. And you know, there are people who are taller than me, like Chad, and, and people who are better looking than me, like, well, Shahan. And, uh, sorry, Chad, but, and, uh, and you know, there, there are people who can run faster, people who are stronger, there are people who are smarter, and there are clearly people whose brains operate at a higher level than maybe our brains do. But I don't know if anyone's brain operates at a higher level than, than Jesus's. And then it says that we have the mind of Christ. But normally that, that's applied in such a way where it means we're not stupid anymore. And they, what, what a waste of the mind of Christ. Like the, the mind of Christ seems to be applied so much to things like, oh, now I know not to sleep with my girlfriend anymore. I mean, does that really take like a level of genius, right? <laughs> wow, now that I have the mind of Christ, I know I, I shouldn't cheat on my taxes. And, or, and I remember years ago, I, w I was in a car in New York with some friends who were all pastors, and, and one of them asked me, said, Pastor, can we ask you a question? And I always know it's tricky when they call me Pastor Irwin. <laughs> and, uh, and I said, sure, of course. And they said, hey, is it, is it a sin to smoke? I thought, what an interesting question. And, and I looked at them and I said, does everything have to be a sin? Can, can some things just be stupid? <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and it, it was real quiet. And, and I, I didn't realize that everyone in the car smoked except for me. And, uh, and that they at least had to process that. And, and what I find is that almost everywhere we apply the mind of Christ, it's really just about not being stupid. And, and I'm just wondering, I'm not even sure, because I, there's no real evidence on a broad scale that the mind of Jesus could actually make us smarter. It doesn't appear to be true, but I think maybe it's because we didn't know it was available. Because one of the greatest challenges for me, I'm just gonna be really frank, in, in the culture of Christianity and the movement of Jesus is that it's a suffocating movement at how low our level of thinking is. We, we, we thrive in cliche. We ignore the deep issues of life. We pretend that the pain and brokenness of the human experience can be easily solved by just memorizing a verse in the Bible. And so I, I just want to talk for a few minutes about elevating our intelligence. I, I just recently 
released a master class called The Art of Communication. And I priced it at a really high price, not what it's worth, but a fairly high price, because I, I wanted to filter out the people who didn't really want to think. I, I, I only wanted to invest in the people who believed that the art of communication was the most important engagement of their mind. That they wanted to take their, their ideas, their thoughts, their values, their vision, and treat it not just as an art form, but as the highest responsibility of engagement with the world. And what struck me is almost no pastor signed up, almost all business people. And, and I, I was struck how that is, to me, such a reflection of the culture that we live in. And, and then I would get people ask me things like, well, isn't it just the Holy Spirit? And I know that's what we're supposed to say, but if, if you visit churches, the Holy Spirit is not doing well. Because most of us are actually living lives that are not spiritual, they're magical. We, we, we think that when we are spiritual people that things are supposed to happen by magic because now we believe in Jesus. I've spent the last 40 years of my life studying human capacity. Now, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to do that as, as a follower of Jesus because I'm only supposed to talk about what God can do in you. I'm not supposed to talk about what you can do, even without God. Have you realized people can do a lot without God? I mean, I know we want to say God did everything, but, but someone who doesn't believe in God created your iPhone. And so you have deeper loyalty to someone who doesn't believe in God than to God because you spend more time with your iPhone probably than you do with God. <laughs> and so you have to realize that human capacity is extraordinary. I mean, human capacity created the television, created the airplane, created the submarine. Are we allowed to say that or do we have to pretend everything happens by magic? The greatest chess players in the world are not people who believe in Jesus. They're just brilliant chess players. And I think sometimes we, we ignore that because we don't want to deal with the reality of the world we live in. And the greatest communicators in the world are no longer people who believe in Jesus. And it's because we keep thinking that our greatness will come by magic. I'm going to love Jesus and then it's just going to happen. Now, what really frustrates me is that I think that we're living beneath our God-given potential, our God-given capacity. That if we have the mind of Christ, we should have an extraordinary advantage on the rest of the world. And so no matter what's out there in the world of human genius, we, we have this other ingredient that we may not even fully understand. I mean, if someone said to you, maybe your, your side passion is painting. You're a pastor, but you love to paint. And if someone said to you, I can give you the mind of Picasso, what would you do? Would you say, yeah, I'd love to have, I'd love to have the mind of Picasso. If someone said to you, uh, I'm going to give you the mind of Bobby Fischer so you can play chess, what would you, what would you say? You know, imagine if someone said to you, I will give you the mind of Stephen Hawking and the body of LeBron James, just to add a little <laughs> dynamic here. I think we would all run and absorb it, and we would not treat it as if it had no value. And if we were playing chess, we would not wake up in the morning going, you know, today I'm going to use my mind. I'm not going to use Bobby Fischer's mind, because I've got this. So if you're in the world of physics, you wouldn't wake up in the morning going, you know, I'm not going to use my Einstein brain. I'm just going to use my brain. Because you'd look like a fool if you had access to the mind of Picasso, but you decided to paint with your own mind, not with the mind of Picasso. And yet we live our lives with the full extent of our minds, never accessing the mind of Christ. And I keep wondering, why do we do this? And is it because we simply do not understand the access that we have? I, I think there are, are shadows of this in, in the human experience. And I, I know this is not the kind of talk that we expect at a pastor's event, especially when it's Pentecostal. But if you could just stay with me for a few moments. In 1968, NASA hired a man named George Land because they needed to identify geniuses to work for NASA to help them with technology engineering so they could control the, the space industry. 
So George Land created a genius assessment that later became known as a creativity assessment. And they first tested it on children. And what's interesting is that in 1993, the Head Start program picked up his assessment. And what they found was that when they tested five-year-olds, 98% of five-year-olds tested out as geniuses. 98%! That means that you had a high chance of actually testing out as a genius as a child, no matter who you are now. They followed these children in a longitudinal study, and they tested them again when they were 10 years old. And when they were 10 years old, only 30% of them tested out as geniuses. And they followed them five years later when they were 15 years old, and only 12% of them tested out as geniuses. And then they studied 280,000 people, average age 31, and only 2% of them tested out as geniuses. So somewhere between birth and adulthood, what was a natural expression of being human was lost. So what it tells me is that 98% of us were born with the measurements and capacity of genius, but only 2% of us will live our lives expressing that genius. Now, I'm a part of a, of a group that's a little different than this group. It, it's only around 100, 150 people, and they, they pay $100,000 a year to be in that group. Pastor Chad invited you for free. So you paid $100,000 less. And I speak at both, so you're getting this for free. <laughs> and, and their companies have to minimally make $100 million a year to be in that group. And in the group is a guy named Walter, who from his estimation has the highest IQ in the world. And there was a TV show that was made after him called Scorpion. And so this guy who perhaps has had the highest IQ in the world at some point in his life came up to me one day, sat down next to me after I spoke, and he said, I'm told that a conversation between us is inevitable. I love being inevitable. It's just a good word. But I was a little nervous because here's the guy with the highest IQ in the world, and, and I cover the other side of the spectrum. And so I thought, how is this conversation going to go? And, <laughs> and he was clearly trying to be intellectually intimidating. And so I sat there and I said, well... Walter, I love being inevitable, let's talk. And he opened up by saying to me, I want to be clear, I listened to your presentation. I disagree with half of everything you said. That's a good way to begin, don't you think? And, uh, and then he said, and by the way, all I have to do is show you the facts. The facts are against you. And then I had to make another presentation in front of this group after that conversation. And so when I came back on the platform, I said, hey, Walter and I had a great conversation. The guy with the highest IQ in the world said he disagreed with half of everything I said. And this is, to me, so encouraging because the smartest man in the world agrees with half of everything I said. <laughs> and, and one of us is making progress because maybe he's halfway there. Then I said, but Walter, you also said that the facts are against me. This is where I want to apply this. See, the reason he was saying the facts are against me is because I was proposing that human beings are living beneath their God-created capacity. That we're living at this 2% of genius, and we think that genius is a, is a sociological anomaly. It's just for the rare, and the rest of us are simply here to admire it. But that the reality is that we're all created as geniuses with this creative capacity. Our culture, our environment, our experiences diminishes the genius within us because it's easier to control humans when you force them to conform and standardize than when you allow them to be unique and creative. And that's an indictment on us as a church as well because discipleship has been exactly about standardization and exactly about conformity and it has driven people into the box. And the church should be the epicenter of human creativity. And so I said, Walter, when you say the facts are against me, I had to reflect on that because I think you're right. And in fact, the reality is all of my life, the facts have been against me. That's been my journey as a follower of Jesus. That's been my journey as a pastor. 
most of my Christian experience, and thank you for inviting me, I have been known as a heretic. Yeah. That, that's 99% of my experience. And I've worked as a futurist for companies, and, and, and then I worked as a futurist for denominations and churches, and here's the difference. When you work with a company, they have an economic bottom line, so they have to look at the truth no matter how painful it is. But the church doesn't. And so when people would ask me, what do you do as a futurist when you work with churches? I go, oh, I just talk about the present. Because churches are so far in the past that they think the present is the future. How is it possible that we are the last to change, the last to innovate, the last to create when we are connected to the creator of the universe? So the facts are against me. The facts say only 2% of humans have the ingredients of genius within them. But I said, Walter, the facts have always been against me because the facts are always for the past. The facts are never for the future. See, the facts have always been against me, but the future is for me. I think it's insane that 20 years ago, I was actually banished from Christian organizations because I actually said humans create the future. I know some of you are going, wait a minute, that's wrong. <laughs> Only God creates the future, right? But that's the problem, is that we're so entrenched in magic. See, beavers create dams. They don't wake up going, what should I do today? <laughs> you know, should I build a bridge? A condominium? No, beavers create dams because they are created by God to create dams. Silkworms create silk. They never wake up going, I'm going to create a polyester blend. It's going to be like really light and airy. And they just create silk. And the same way that, that bees create hives and ants create colonies, humans create futures. But, but we actually think that it's somehow stealing something from God. But the reality is every time you choose, you create a future. Humans are designed to create. That's our inherent nature. And so part of what my mission in life is, is to awaken the genius in every human being. To believe that the creative future is possible. But a part of our problem is that when you unlock creativity in people, they do stupid things. They do things that will hurt the reputation, they go off the path, they embarrass us, they, they do human things. And we would rather have people sin less and conform more than discover their creativity and their uniqueness even in the mess of their humanity. I know, I'm not sure if you should applaud either. So how does this connect to the art of communication? Well, I started processing, and, and I've said for years, I'm not, I'm not as much a theologian as I am an anthropologist. Because I don't think God should be studied. I think God should be known. I'm an anthropologist because I study humans, because I want to understand what it looks like to have the image of God in us. What does that really mean in life? And I started realizing that part of the unique dynamic that connects us to God is the creative process. See, have you ever heard that God created out of nothing? Ex nihilo, there's even like a Latin phrase. You know that's not biblical, right? God did not create out of nothing. God created out of something. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that everything that is seen was made out of that which is not seen. It doesn't say out of that which does not exist. It says out of that which is not seen. There's difference. There's a difference between something that is not and something that is not seen. When something is not, it's not. See? <laughs> but when it's not seen, it's still there, but you can't see it. It's like the oxygen in this room. The oxygen is here, you just can't see it. But if it was not here, you would know it. There'd be a visceral shift in our comfort. So when the Bible says that God created everything that is seen out of that which is not seen, what's he creating out of? What's the, in the material? See, God created out of his imagination. God first imagined it and then spoke it into creation. And God gave us the same incredible capacity to imagine and then create. See, what makes humans different than every other species is that humans can materialize the invisible. 
That's what a vision is. I mean, as long as you can Pentecostal it, it'll make sense. All right? We have dreams and visions. Isn't that what the scriptures tell us? Except what does that really mean? It means that the future exists within our imagination before it becomes reality. You are living right now inside of someone else's imagination. Someone imagined this building, and they, they imagined it, and then they created it, and then you walked into it because you're living inside of someone else's imagination. When Barack Obama became president of the United States, he was walking inside of the dream of Martin Luther King Jr. He said, one day I have a dream that one day a man will be measured not by the color of his skin, by the content of his character. And we've not realized that Barack Obama walked into the dream of MLK Jr. See, whether you think this country has it all together or not, we're living inside of the dream of Jefferson and Washington and Adams and Franklin. We're living inside of their dream. And sometimes we live inside of someone's nightmare. But what drives me crazy is that people who love God keep waiting for God to do something. We keep waiting for God to create the better future, but people who don't believe in God, they don't wait for permission to create the future they imagine. So when are we going to understand our creative power? And a part of our creative power lies in the words we speak. And so God spoke and said, let there be light. And the creative action began. And God creates us with this incredible gift called the imagination where we can see a future that does not exist. You can see a you that no one else can see. And in fact, the part of the reason we get depressed, anybody struggle with depression? The reason you get depressed is because you can imagine a you that you're not. You can imagine a life you do not have. You can imagine a future you don't believe will ever come. If you could not imagine more, you could never feel discouraged, depressed, anxious, or stressed. Because it would just be what it is. Depression, anxiety, stress. All of that is your soul letting you know that you can create more. That you're created for more. So why settle for less? And the power of that creative essence comes in our words. It, it, it's an odd relationship. It drives me crazy in LA. We have, you know, my wife hates when I use LA words like energy, universe, <laughs> manifesting. She's like, don't use that language because my wife's from the deep south. <laughs> and, and you know, 40 years ago, I'm talking about energy. She goes, I hate that word. I said, yeah, but the word for spirit, dunamis, is actually like expulsive energy. It's energy. We, we are. We are energy machines. She goes, I still hate the word, but now we have energy drinks. So she lost. We have energy bars. Right? I said, honey, the whole world has caught up with me. The, the whole world knows everything is energy now. And, and then we use the word universe. She goes, I hate the word universe. Why won't people say God? I said, it's because they don't know God. They just feel the effect of God, so they call it the universe. It's just like you say, did you see the wind move? You didn't see the wind move. You saw the leaves blow. But you don't go, oh, did you see the leaves blow? Because you understand there's an invisible force behind the visible manifestation. And so when people talk about the universe, they're actually being touched by God. They just don't know it. And then in LA, there's this whole language of manifesting. And I go, you know, the problem with manifesting is that it doesn't work. Because I know I've tried. Right? Just in case. I, I give it all a shot. You know, I go, you know, <laughs> maybe it works. I'm just going to throw it out there. But you know, b b before people who were more like into like this more new age spiritualization started manifesting, you Pentecostals were doing a long time ago. You were speaking things into reality that never happened. You were giving prophetic words that never became true. And you just ignored them later and pretended you never said them. And I, and I understand. Because you see, what, what happens is that Manifesting becomes, again, a shadow of a reality because when you speak in alignment with what God is speaking, it creates. But you have to listen to be able to speak with that kind of power and authority. And I started getting frustrated because people with bad ideas are actually shaping the world because they're better at communicating. Because they have taken a higher stewardship 
of the art of communication than people who have entrusted the truth of God. And, and yet, because we think, well, it's the Holy Spirit. He's supposed to just quicken me, and then I can preach. And, like, I'll be on fire. And what I find is, like, a lot of people have, like, all this intensity, but nothing to say. And I'm like, you ever been stuck in the middle of the night with a blinking red light, but there's no traffic anywhere? You're like, should I go? Should I stay? Should I go? Should I stay? <laughs> that's like a lot of our preaching. It's like, there's a light that's flashing, but I don't know if anything's really going on. And what, what the pandemic has done for us, it has exposed us, it has left us naked. Because we all had to go online and we realized we're all saying the same thing. And what has elevated in our culture are the people who actually have something to say that helps. And we have to ask ourselves, first of all, do I have something to say that actually makes a difference? And then secondly, do I know how to say it in a way that makes an impact on a person's life? You know, one of the things that uh, has always intrigued me is this concept of phantom pain. They told me there's a clock. There it is. I couldn't see it. I was looking to the left, and, but God was to the right. And uh, I've always been, uh, like, struck by phantom pain. Is phantom pain is this phenomenon that if you lose a leg or lose an arm, you, you feel that limb still there years after it's gone. And what's odd is that you'll feel pain in your hand even though your whole arm is gone. And, and soldiers experience this all the time when they've landed on a landmine or they had to lose a, a limb at war. And the curious thing about phantom pain is that it can only happen if you lose something that you once had. And I started thinking about human ideals. My, my wife, Kim, just came back from Ukraine, and she went into Kiev, and she was there working, and she's been leading some projects in the middle of that war-torn region. And, and my wife can't shake this belief that the world could one day have peace. Isn't that ridiculous? Like, some of you, you you're giving your life to things that human history says will never happen. See, that we, we believe in a world where everyone have justice, but we've never known a world where everyone has justice. See, we believe in a world where, where there could be world peace, but we've never known a world except with war. See, we believe in a world where no poverty exists, but we've never known a world except for a world with poverty. And, but it, what is interesting to me is that we're, we're driven by these human ideals that we've never experienced or known. See, now I think human ideals are the phantom pain of the soul, that it's our soul reminding us what it really looks like when we become human again. And the power of communicating and preaching and speaking is to call out the humanity. And I think sometimes we forget that God is not apart from the human story. He created us in his image and likeness. He created us interconnected with him. And so if there's a truth in the scriptures that we are actually living out well, it will actually change our human experience, not just our beliefs. And, and even when we're talking about, you know, living the right standards, isn't that almost like a part of the dilemma? Is that the grace of Jesus says that well, the standards are erased because we're no longer measured by the standards. But then if you don't live up to the standards, you no longer have the credibility to speak about grace. And so it's a tension, but, but there may be another thought. How about if you were fully alive, you wouldn't need the standards anymore? You see, if we were fully alive, if we woke up every day filled with a sense that there's beauty and wonder all around us to be lived. We wouldn't have to settle for something less. You, you don't eat garbage if you actually have a gourmet meal available to you. You have to be retrained sometimes because all you've eaten is McDonald's. But once you tasted that which is so enriching and fulfilling, you don't go back to the other. Maybe the problem is not that pastors are not living up to the standard. Maybe the problem is that we're not alive. I, I just did this um, event with a guy named Ryan Holiday, who's uh, well known as a Stoic, and he's written quite a few books on Stoicism. And, and I told him, I said, you know, I've been listening to your Instagram, and, and, and you, I don't disagree with anything you say. I think everything you say, because you're quoting the Stoics, and I love the Stoics. I love Marcus Aurelius. 
and Seneca, and I said, I just agree with everything you say. The, the, the only thing is that you're so serious. He's young. You're always serious, and you're always so intense. You never seem happy. I said, I feel so shallow, because I actually enjoy life. I said, what makes you happy? And, and I, I, I thought, this is, it's so interesting that we have to just have a conversation about, do you love life? Have you ever thought that when you say to someone, give your life to Jesus, that he will change your life? They may look at you and going, nah, I don't, it's okay. Because no one is trying to figure out how to be more moral. I, I'm sorry. I, I know that may be desperately painful news to you. No one is trying to figure out how to be holier. People are desperately trying to figure out how to be alive. How not to be, not to be suffocated by existing by insignificance, by emptiness, by disconnection. People are drowning in their aloneness and they don't know how to come out of it. And then we say, oh, give your life to Jesus because he will minimize how much you sin. That is the least attractive invitation the world has ever heard. You say, no, Jesus is the source of life and love and hope and joy and he will make you alive. But back to communication. We have a little granddaughter. Her name is Juno. I, I, it's kind of awesome. My daughter has a daughter, or my wife reminds me, our daughter has a daughter. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy. And, and, and Mariah called us yesterday, but it was not, it, it was not a FaceTime. It was just a, a, a phone message. You couldn't see her. And she just kept talking over my daughter. Now, she's only 11 months old, and she doesn't say anything intelligibly. But she just kept talking over Mariah. That this is amazing. She has more to say, but nothing she says can be understood. And I thought, oh, that's us to the world. Wouldn't it be a tragedy if there were millions and millions of people desperately searching for hope and would be so open to Jesus, but we were just speaking at the wrong frequency? I remember. 20 years ago, I read about this, uh, this whale that was called the loneliest whale in the world. Now there's a documentary on him. He's now a celebrity. <laughs> and, but what struck me was that this whale would travel the Pacific alone. And when other whale pods would go by this whale, he would be unaware of it, and they were or unaware of him. Because the way that whales communicate is by sending out a frequency. And, and because his frequency wasn't around 40 hertz and his frequency was at 52 hertz, he remained unheard. And he couldn't hear anyone else because he couldn't hear at the frequency of the, all the other whale pods. And they were saying they didn't even know specifically what species of whale he was because he was the singular whale. And I have to tell you, inside of my soul, I always said to myself, oh, I think that explains my life. I'm a, I'm a 52 hertz whale searching for my pod. But then I realized that there were a lot of people without Jesus who were also 52 hertz. That, that the reality is that there are people out there desperately searching for God, trying to make sense of life, trying to see if Jesus is really real. But because we keep communicating the gospel the same way over and 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 over again. And we then determine that if they don't respond to our messages, it's because their hearts are hardened and they're closed to the message of Jesus. You know, if you could just elevate your frequency, you would see so many people respond to Jesus that it would astonish you because we have the mind of Christ. So if I just have one challenge for you, it's, it, it, you know, take it from a guy who's now been alive for a while. Now I'm 63. Now I get to be the old guy in the room. I used to be you. But now I'm the old guy in the room. And I can tell you that this is the great dilemma. To be popular as a Christian speaker will make you irrelevant to humanity. And you're going to have to decide where your fame will come from. You're going to have to decide whether you will confuse the Christian church because your message doesn't sound right. Whether you will listen to those who do not know Jesus and learn their frequency and begin to communicate the message of Jesus in such a way where a whole new world opens up. 
And I came to faith in my early 20s. I remember saying to Jesus, I, I want to do either what no one else can do or what no one else will do. And I spent the next 10 years of my life working with drug cartels. It was not the world I expected to go into. And I spent my life with assassins and gang leaders and, and it was a whole different world. I had to learn an entirely different frequency. I remember when I first started speaking, I, I mean, I would speak in the middle of projects. I would take my basketball, play one-on-one, -on -one, earn the right to be heard, and then speak to open crowds and projects. And I would walk into entire complexes that were covered by Uzi machine guns and only one family living inside where they ran the drug um, operation for the cartels. And, and my wife would tell me, who are you speaking to? Because, you know, I, I had an education. I know you can't tell, but I'm an educated person. And early on, I wanted to make sure people were smart, so I made sure no one could understand me. And my wife would look at me and say, who are you talking to? Because there's nobody in the room who understood anything you said. I said, yeah, but they knew I was smarter than them. That's not what I said, that's what I thought. And then one day I realized I'm really stupid. Because if I'm incapable of translating the most important truths in the world in the simplest way possible, then I'm a fool. And I learned how to communicate in a whole different world. And then it seemed like God then just kept changing the world and changing the world and changing the world. And I had to learn a different language every time. See, I'm an immigrant from El Salvador. English is my second language. Spanish is my first language. And I had to learn this language that you speak, because especially as Americans, it's the only language you speak. But you have to realize that even when you learn English, you may not know the language a person is speaking. Because you have to understand what has shaped their values, what shapes their worldview, what shapes their passions, what shapes their fears and doubts. And as you understand that person, then you can unlock the universe within them. So I'm convinced that you're a creative genius. I am. I'm just kind of quick survey. My time's almost up. How many would say, just inherently, I know I'm a creative genius. That's the way I live my life. One, two, three, four, barely, fives and a half. All right, not too many. Yeah, you can upgrade your next event. And, uh, all right, but how many would say that, that you're a, a linguistic savant? And if you know what savant is, don't raise your hand. Okay, how many would say, I'm a linguistic savant? Like I'm a genius with languages. Wow, okay, nobody, okay. Okay, how old were you when you learned English? Were you 21, 18, 15, 12? No, you learned English when you were two. See, when you were two, you were a linguistic savant. And if they had moved you out of Burbank to Tokyo, you would have learned Japanese like you were a genius. If they had moved you to Berlin, you would have learned German like a genius. If they had moved you to Manila, you would have learned Tagalog like a genius. If they had moved you to London, you would have learned English like a genius. <laughs> because when you were born, you were a creative genius. But you convinced yourself you are not. When you were born, you were a linguistic savant. But your brain was told, I only need one language, you can shut the rest of it down. You have the mind of Christ. Are you gonna leave the mind of Jesus unaccessed in your life? Or are you gonna elevate the frequency of who you are? Because the world needs not just your genius, the world needs the genius of Jesus unwrapped in your skin, given as a gift to the world. And my hope and my prayer is that the movement of Jesus would have the greatest communicators the greatest thinkers, the greatest creators that human history has ever known. And God bless you guys.